Okay, um, today we're talking about principles of interpretation. Today will be a little different. Len, I need to tell you, if you're going to sit there, we've got the camera sitting on that table, and that's fine, but if you jostle the table, you're going to jostle. <laughs> that's what Chris did. No guarantees. That's, 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 that's what Chris did. did. So, okay, maybe we need to change that back next week. But uh, we want to try it this way because it's very hard for Carol to see sure. the, the, the screen behind it. Um, all along so far, well, first let me stop and say, do you all have any questions or comments from your reading? Grasping God's words, are you keeping up with the reading? What do you think? Is it good? Good book. Yeah. Good book. Now, it outlines a very disciplined approach to studying God's word. This is serious stuff, and rightly so. In fact, today we are I'm gonna I've been talking about some of the very practical kinds of step, methods of interpretation, understanding inerrancy of scripture, and various attitudes toward that. So we've been dealing with the text and what we're to understand about it and how we're to approach it. Today I want to sort of turn it around and we're going to deal with that a little bit, but mostly today we're going to be talking about you or me. In other words, not the interpretation act so much as the interpreter. Uh, so today we're going to be dealing almost more in a devotional kind of approach in terms of how we have the right attitude. What do we need to be doing for our sakes, not in terms of application to the text and to finding the meaning of the text. Okay, we need to we need to be prepared ourselves, personally, spiritually. So we're going to deal with some of that today. <clears throat> I will say, um, giving you guys a break next week, a few of you heard me say this earlier, um, that I've, I have some catching up I need to do, especially because I need to be preparing that, what, what you need to know from each of the classes, and so next week you're getting a midterm break. Um, we will still be fine. I was reviewing what the content was. Um, as some of you know, some, some terms, we've had seven week terms, some eight week terms. This was scheduled as eight. I feel we can, we'll be fine with seven, and so we're going to take a midterm break next week. We will not have class, and that's any of the three classes next week. So you can get caught up on your reading. You can pray and meditate about all the PowerPoints, uh, whatever else that you, you need to, and then we'll come back together on March 5th with uh, interpreting the New Testament, then interpreting the Old Testament the following week. And I know that sounds out of order, but uh, one of the points we're going to talk about today is understanding that all of the Bible does indeed point to Jesus. So we'll start with the New Testament and then, and then come in with the Old Testament. We'll discuss that some. And then applying the principles will be the act of preaching and teaching that I had on here before. Any questions about that? Well, remember, this was what we said our mandate was from Scripture, from 2 Timothy 2. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, and who correctly handles the word of truth. We focused on that, correctly handling the word of truth, um, but now, as I say, today we're going to back up a little bit and, and focus more on the do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. So we're going to talk about you a little bit, as opposed to focusing on the text and the meaning and drawing the meaning out of the text. And to do that, I want to start by looking at a couple of slides of a passage of Scripture. It is the longest of the Psalms, 119. Uh, King David, in writing this, I picked this up in verse, uh, verse 9. <clears throat> I actually could have used all of Psalm 119, but we would have been here a while. Um, David, in Psalm 119, is specifically talking about desiring to understand, to receive and understand and be blessed by God's Word. It is exactly what we're talking about when we talk about personal growth through biblical interpretation, except he's talking about the law and, of course, the Old Testament stuff. Martin Luther, no less than Martin Luther, noted the pattern of how David talks about God's Word in Psalm 119, and Luther insisted that Psalm 119 would be a very helpful instruction book for us as we seek to study God's Word. And so I want to read a couple of the passages from a couple of slides here and then talk about that a little bit. It begins, um, Psalm 19 begins with David sort of doing an honest self-assessment of where he is and what his needs are and how he will find the answer to those needs in his Word. So I'm going to read the two slides and then we'll talk about them a little bit. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. And there are a lot of acronyms in here for scripture. 
your word commands the law. You know, so notice all of these different words that David is using in reference to the written word of God. And of course, he had the, uh, the everything that had been written up until his time. But we now have all of that, plus the Psalms, the rest of the prophets that came later, and the New Testament. So, I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. Every one of these verses makes reference to the word. With my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in, your stat in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. Be good to your servant while I live, that I may obey your word. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. I am a stranger on earth. Do not hide your commands from me. My soul is consumed with longing for your law at all times. You rebuke the arrogant who are accursed, those who stray from your commands. Remove from me their scorn and contempt, for I keep your statutes. Though rulers sit together and slander me, your servant will meditate on your decrees. Your statutes are my delight. They are my counselors. And continuing. Verse 25. I am laid low in the dust. Preserve my life according to your word. I gave an account of my ways, and you answered me. Teach me your decrees. Cause me to understand the way of your precepts, that I may meditate on your wonderful deeds. My soul is weary with sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. Keep me from deceitful ways. Be gracious to me and teach me your law. I have chosen the way of faithfulness. I have set my heart on your laws. I hold fast to your statutes, Lord. Do not let me be put to shame. I run in the path of your commands, for you have broadened my understanding. Teach me, Lord, the way of your decrees, that I may follow it to the end. Give me understanding so that I may keep your law and obey it with all my heart. Direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find a delight. Turn my heart toward your statutes and not toward selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. Every verse in there refers to God's word, to the scripture as it existed in David's time. And that same those same principles carry over to the word today. And so as we consider um, what it means to be students of and interpreters of God's word, we need to take this seriously. You know, we need to read and meditate on and study all that David is saying about this, that we need to seek the Lord with all our heart in his word, that we need to not stray from the commands he gives in his word, that we need to understand and learn his decrees found in Scripture. We need to obey His Word and, and ask God not to hide the commands from us, uh, but rather to give us a deep understanding of them. And on and on, all of these things are how we need to prepare ourselves, and this is the kind of yearning and desire we need to have for God's Word. It is a spiritual discipline for us to do this, and it doesn't happen like that. It requires some effort. One of the things you get a clear sense of, I think, uh, in David's writing here of Psalm 119, is that David worked at this. I mean, you read all of these passages in 119, and he's not just taking this lightly and tossing off a few, you know, reading a few verses and then going about his day. You get the sense that David is meditating on this in the sense that he's studying God's Word, he's repeating it uh, out loud, he's taking literally the words of this book, He's reading them and rereading them. Um, later on, he talks about the fact that he talks about it, he meditates on it, he speaks of it, he sings of it, he hears the word, he reads the word by day and night. The, there is nothing about God's commands that is, is not a focus for David. And that's what we're called to as well. And again, we come, too often even as Christians, we, we have this sort of assumption that, you know, the Bible is a good thing, and if, you know, if we read it and study it, that'd be good. It should be our whole life. Everything, you know, our Christian faith should be our whole life. And our Christian faith is based upon, our, our knowledge of Jesus is based upon what? God's Word. There, it's not possible to focus on this too much. Now, interestingly, um, you know, I come from the South, and I did not come from a Christian family. I, I'm pleased to say later on my parents changed their mind about this. But when I became a Christian, through the influence of high school friends, um, one of the things they said to me was, you know, we've known people who went crazy reading that Bible too much. You ever heard that? 
It's not an uncommon thing that people say in the South when they think someone's being too religious, right? Um, and I didn't say anything, but my immediate thought was if somebody went crazy reading the Bible, they were crazy when they started. <laughs> but there is sort of an attitude, either unconsciously or sometimes, as in that expression, consciously. And both my parents, my father was baptized when he was 80. So um, I, I think they both came to the Lord later in life. Um, but this idea that some people actually think that too much Bible is a bad idea. It's not. There's no way it could be. Read David. But more common, and maybe even more problematic, because it's not out where you can see it, are the assumptions people make that, yeah, you know, I, I, I like to read the Bible. The fact is that the vast majority of church-attending, professing Christians do not read the Bible at all. The majority, studies have shown that the majority of Christians, you know, like 74% or something, the only exposure they get to Bible, to the Bible, is what gets read in church on Sunday morning, or if they happen to be part of a small group and they do something there, you know, in terms of reading a, a devotional or something of that sort. In terms of their own initiative and what they do in their own lives, people do not study Christians. Do not study God's Word. And the, the devil loves nothing better than that. I mean, I think it's enough reason to study God's Word just to stick it to Satan, if nothing else, and say, I'll show you. But a, a more noble motivation, and one we probably should be focused on, is that it is honoring to God. It is an obedience to God. It is, it is how God speaks to us. All of this. We cannot have an accurate understanding of what God desires for our life unless we are in His Word. It's as simple as that. It is fair to say that most Christians or a great number of Christians are the type that do not like to read the Bible. They do it because they feel obliged to. Well, the, most Christians, if you, I think if you ask them, they would say, oh yeah, Bible, good. But then they don't do anything with it. Well, they don't actually study it. They don't read it. Um, and those who do go at it the wrong way or with the wrong expectations, and so they get frustrated by it. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today, too. <laughs> Um, somebody who, well, when Carolyn and I first got married, we decided we, you know, we were going to start studying God's Word together, and so we decided to start with the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is a terrible book <laughs> to use for joint devotions, because we started calling Isaiah the dyslexic prophet. Because he'll be talking about something, and then he'll head fake, and he'll be on something completely different. It's like this huge book, 60-some chapters, of of aphorisms. I mean, they're like almost one-off. And, and it's very difficult. There's no flow. There's no narrative. And I'm, not, I'm not criticizing Isaiah. It's, it's spectacular. Um, that's the reason we use it so much in, at, at uh, Christmas time. But in terms of sitting down with somebody else and using it as a Bible study, there's an example. Somebody who sat down and that was their first exposure. If they decided I'm going to study the Bible, here's a big book. I've heard of Isaiah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read that one. Their head's going to be spinning very shortly. They're going to be doing the Linda Blair thing. Okay. Um, that's not where to start. And so some of it is that people go about it the wrong way, they have the wrong expectations, and they get frustrated and confused. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. Marvin? Well, I think the biggest problem is we really don't take the Bible seriously enough. And I really like to, in the, in the reading, uh, when the stop sign is there, the policeman will give you a ticket if you do not stop. And if you think, well, that means I need to be careful, look around and then keep on going, yeah. that's not what it said. When the Bible says, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, that's what it says. And we can't say, oh, well, that's uh, just, you know, uh, or do unto others as you have them do unto you. Do we actually do, or do we kind of just, well, you know, if we think I speak in license, we kind of ignore the bad people. We misinterpret them. So even though we may read it and read it and read it, if we can kind of not take it seriously, then it won't make any difference in our lives. Right. Exactly. And uh, earlier in this class, I talked about paying attention. That some people may read the word, but they're not paying attention. They're not being observant. They don't really care. They don't really notice what it says. And so therefore, yeah, they don't They don't get it. I, I don't, it's kind of hard, some of the stuff that it says. You know, I really don't want to change my life. I like how things are. Yeah. So we can kind of minimalize it and say, well, it's not just like the stop sign. I thought that was such a good example. Yeah, you know. good. I, I did a series of sermons early on here, so it's been several years ago, um, called Do You Believe It? 
And I started out with the 23rd Psalm. You know, walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I broke all of that up. I mean, I actually started with the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And, and I simply said after each of those passages, I said, do you believe it? This is God's word. Do you really believe that you can be without want? Do you really believe that God will anoint your head with oil, that you'll sit in the presence of your enemies and have no fear, that you'll walk through the valley of the shadow of death and not be afraid? Do you believe that? Because if you don't, then tear that whole chapter out of your Bible, because it shouldn't be in there if you don't believe it. And on and on and on. All of this stuff that we, you know, we even, we even know it, we've memorized it, and yet we've never spent time to think about, what does this really say, and do I believe that? We've never really paid attention. It's like, okay, I like the stop sign, as long as I don't get caught, I'm okay. No, it's, the point isn't trying to get oh, by, the point is to obey and to understand what all's in there. And David is a good model for that, in terms of the passion. He goes on and on and on and on, in every way imaginable, talking about, Lord, Give me the grace and understanding of your word, because that will, that will be everything I need. Now, don't misunderstand me. You know, Jesus is what we need. But as I've said before, where do we find him? Where are we introduced to him? Where are we taught about him? It is in God's word. And the Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts, but he speaks to our heart through what God has given us in the word. That's one of the Holy Spirit's big jobs, is to interpret the word to us and apply it to us. And in it, we find Jesus. So... Scripture is fundamental to everything that we are to be as Christians. And yet, most Christians, and I, that's not just me saying that. S statistics show, studies have proven, the majority of people who would say they believe the Bible, they attend church, they are committed Christians, evangelical Christians even, the majority of them do not read God's Word. Marvin? Well, I'm thinking that too many of us feel that God is kind of our little servant, and He exists to make us happy and comfortable and and heal us. Right. We use healing specifically in some churches where everybody come forward and get healed. And that's what God's there for. And it's, you know, uh, <clears throat> Paul had a, had a problem. Other people who were sick in the New Testament, uh, they had problems. They had suffering. His job is not to make us feel good and be happy all the time. And we, we miss that. Yeah. Yeah, there was a big controversy with the Osteens, Joel and Victoria Osteen. Because she said, and this was televised, it was to, to, you know, they had 25,000 members or whatever. And she said, um, you know, the thing God wants more than anything else is for you to be happy. When you are happy, then God is, God is happy. That's not what God's primor, primary goal is. God, you know, and there was a huge kerfuffle over that one. Um, God's goal is not primarily for us to be happy. <coughs> when we have joy then God is pleased in that joy. But joy and happiness is not the same thing. Happiness is dependent upon circumstances. Joy rises above circumstances. But the very idea that one of the larger churches in America, that they would say and teach, uh, and this is sort of at the core of the prosperity gospel, um, that God wants you to be happy, and when you're happy, God's happy. And that's the whole point. No, it's not. Because if you believe that's true, then where's the place of suffering? Where is the place of repentance? Where, where all of the aspects of deep spirituality are gone if we believe and if we teach that God's whole focus is for us to be happy. Well, and then all those people feel so guilty. What am I doing wrong? Right. What am I... Yeah. That I have this going on? Right. Marvin? Just ties right back to the 23rd Psalm, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. So you mean you're going to be walking through the valley of the shadow yeah. of death, and I will fear no evil. It's not saying I will be happy, but I will not be afraid. Yeah, and, and, when, I, and when I preached that sermon, I said, it does not say there is no valley of the shadow of death. It does not say there is not evil. It says you don't have to be afraid of it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's not, it, it's not a pass. We don't get a buy from all of the difficult things in life. Um, but we have something on which we can depend and rely that takes us beyond that. Uh, but doesn't release us from the responsibility of walking through that valley and sitting at that table. Um, okay, so let's talk about some principles of biblical interpretation. Again, most of these, 
are about you more than they are about the text. There are a couple of them that are sort of instructions on approaching the text, and in that way are similar to some of the things we've said already. As I was preparing this, I, I was concerned because I feel like I've been saying some of the same things over and over again to sort of from a different in a different way uh, in terms of how to do this. But this is distinctive because it's talking more about you. First, <laughs> approach the Bible in prayer. The fact is the human heart is desperately wicked and deceitful. Jeremiah 17, 9 says that. Um, if we try to go to God's Word or try to do anything else for God that is entirely on our own power or in our own righteousness and our own self-justification, um, then we are not going to succeed. If you want to have an appropriate understanding, if you want God to speak to you in and through His Word, then you need to ask for His help. You need to ask for God the Holy Spirit to be present with you. What was all of that that I just read you from Psalm 119? It was David asking God to make the truth of His Word available to him. So David models that for us. We have to go to God in prayer and ask Him to teach us, to show us, to guide us in His Word. Some of it isn't easy to understand. Let's not be unrealistic about that. And yet, God desires to teach us. And that's, a, that's one of the primary responsibilities that the Holy Spirit has taken on, is to... Is to Encourage us, us and enlighten us and teach us through God's Word. Okay? So that's first. Stop me if you all have any questions or comments as we go along. So we approach the Bible in prayer. And we, we said earlier, for instance, that you start the process by praying. But we need to understand clearly it's not just like, okay, okay, God, help me with this, thank you, and then we go to it. It's got to be a sincere, you know, God, without your help, I'm not going to get this. Secondly, read the Bible as a book that points to Jesus. Now, I say this cautiously because I think some people have overplayed this, especially with regard to the Old Testament. However, Jesus did say in John 5, and then it's, it's uh, the same thing as recited in Luke 24, when he's speaking to the Jewish authorities, he says, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Now, whenever they refer to the scriptures, with one very small exception in the New Testament, what are they talking about? The old, what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. So Jesus is saying, you study the scriptures, and yet you don't realize that the scriptures are testifying about me. And in that regard, the Old Testament as well as the New Testament does point to Jesus. And we need to recognize that. Um, if we do not have Jesus as the center point for our interpretation of, of Scripture, then we are going to miss it. Now, having said that, not every text in Scripture points to Jesus in the same way. The Old Testament deals with the promise of the Messiah, with the anticipation, the preparation, everything is, is, uh, is a preface. The Old Testament is a preface to what is coming in Jesus which is why Jesus and the Gospels is the first part of the New Testament, because that's the hinge on which the Old Testament covenant and the New Covenant uh, turn. I, I think we always have to respect the fact that when we talk about interpretation, what was the author's intent, and you know, what, how was it received by the people who heard it? Well, in the Old Testament, not every author was given an insight by God that there was a Messiah coming. You know, it's, that's not the primary focus always. Quite often, like uh, Jeremiah in, in Lamentations, is expressing grief over the destruction of the city and of the temple. Now there is a hope for the future, and he does, but he doesn't express specifically how that hope is to be fulfilled. We know that it was fulfilled not just by the return from Babylonian exile of the Jewish people, but also by Jesus. So they don't, there is also a contextual reality that was true for the people then, who wrote it and who received it. But all of that still points to the ultimate fulfillment of the promises that were made. The ultimate fulfillment being Jesus. And so we always read the Bible, all of it, as how it points to Jesus. Historical context will give us the rest of the background if we're honest with that. Does that make sense? So it is a book about Jesus. The third thing is let Scripture interpret Scripture. What does that mean? Well, uh, this, this admonition to let Scripture interpret Scripture goes all the way back to the early 2nd century. Irenaeus, who was born in 130 AD, 
um, one of the early church fathers and others, and then it was especially emphasized by Augustine in the late 300s and early 400s, they both, uh, Irenaeus and, and Augustine, especially said the way you read the difficult texts of Scripture, the hard passages, the difficult to understand, is by reading them in light of the passages that we do understand. Because the passages that are, that are easier to interpret and understand, in virtually every case, will be the guide you need to help you understand the hard parts. Um, that's what it means when we say, let Scripture interpret Scripture. We believe that the Word of God, the Bible, was inspired by God. It is non-contradictory. People who say, oh, the Bible is full of contradictions. The response you, sh you should have is, well, can you name one? And there, there are several... You know, we, when we talked about um, interpretation, we talked about contradictions and all of that. Most people are just parroting something that they heard somebody else say, when in fact they're not aware of any contradictions. We believe there are no contradictions in the Bible. There are passages that are hard to understand. Well, the best way to understand those passages is to read them in light of other passages that will give us direction and guidance in that. Virtually all cults and heretical groups of every kind, every pseudo-Christian religion and most of the cults and sects that are out there are pseudo-Christian. You know, you get the Branch Davidians, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Christian Science, etc., etc., etc. All of those are pseudo-Christian sects or cults. The, the word cult is considered politically incorrect, but, um, but it's one, a word people understand, and I, so I'm not reluctant to use it. Somebody, somebody once asked um, Clarence Darrow why he had gotten so many contempt of court violations for, for cursing in court. And he said, well, young man, that's because there's so damn few words everybody understands. <laughs> well, when there is a word that everybody understands, like cult, and it's an appropriate one, then I'm not afraid to use it. Um, and I'm also not afraid to sometimes say damn if it seems appropriate. <laughs> Direct quote. Um, but cults and heretical groups often will take a passage out of context, and they will make that the focus of a major doctrinal platform. And that's where they go wrong. Um, we have to look at all of it. I have said before in other classes, not in this one I don't think, don't ever let what we don't understand get overwhelmed by, um, overwhelm us. How do I say this? Don't ever let what you don't understand overwhelm what you do understand. That's what I was trying to say. Um, and I've said it so often. Uh, <laughs> that there are things that, that we're going to struggle with, that are going to be hard, that are not going to be clear. And yet there, are, there is so much more that is clear, and it is direct, and we do understand it. And the best way to deal with the things that are hard that we don't fully understand is to apply the things we do understand to them. And that comes, that's obviously true for Scripture, but it's true for everything else as well. You know, I, if I have a doubt or a struggle of one kind, I, am, I have to be aware enough not to let that drive me away from the far greater and more compelling truth that God has taught me in His Word and in Christ. Okay? Um, and clearly when we're dealing with the Old Testament law and the New, Testament, the New Covenant and the New Testament, there are things that we have to be prepared to understand. Um, the Old Testament is very clear that all men, you know, the, the things said to Abraham, all men of faith are supposed to be circumcised. That's supposed to be a religious requirement. Well, then we get to 1 Corinthians 7, and Paul says that circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. He insists that you don't have to be circumcised to be, and, and he refuses, for instance, to allow Timothy to be circumcised because the Judaizers, the Ebionites, the, the, the technical word, those Jewish Christians who thought you had to be a Jew in order to really follow Jesus, they insisted that Timothy should be circumcised, and Paul said, absolutely not. You know, not going to happen. Um, Titus, I'm sorry, I just got that backwards. He insisted Titus not be circumcised. Timothy, he had to be circumcised so that Timothy would be acceptable as a missionary and a minister to the Jewish people. But it wasn't in order. No, it wasn't so Timothy could be okay. It was so that Timothy could be more effective as a as a minister of the gospel to the Jewish people. But Titus, he said absolutely not, because the only focus there was that they wanted to circumcise Titus because they thought Titus couldn't really be a Christian without being circumcised. So circumcision is no longer required. How do we then deal? We have to take all of that understanding from Paul and apply it back to how the law was fulfilled in Jesus, the law which included the law of circumcision, the requirement of circumcision. And we have to understand all of that and read it in light of the new revelation that was given in the New Testament. 
The law was not done away with, but rather was fulfilled. Jesus is very clear about that. He said, I, not one jot or tittle of the law will, you know, will be done away with. I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. Well, you have to understand that, and you have to interpret those. You know, and somebody says, oh, you have to be circumcised. It says so right here in Genesis 17. Well, you have to say, well, wait a minute, back up. Let's read Paul in 1 Corinthians and see what he has to say about that. A new, the, the later revelation that fulfilled that requirement. Okay. Um, the book of Hebrews says, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. So we have to take the things that are clear. That's a very clear statement and use that as a way of interpreting the things that get confusing sometimes. Understood? Any comments or questions about that? The next point is we have to be willing to meditate on the Bible. Um, I have The way I have taught Bible study is that I think we all need to have two kinds of, of interactions with the Bible. One is we need to simply read it. And I've described that. Carolyn and I both, in the mornings, we come downstairs and we sit and we will do our devotions. And for me, um, in the mornings, that means I just read. I don't have a minimum requirement. I, don't, I just read through the Bible. Wherever I am, and I, I know exactly where I am because my Kindle um, picks up, you know, because I'm reading the Bible out of the Kindle here now. Um, and it's, it's where I left off. And so I will start reading and I don't have a minimum, I don't have a maximum, I don't have a time set. I read until I feel like that's enough for today. And I think about what I'm reading. I pray about what I'm reading. But there are other times when, by itself, that would be too casual. There are other times when I do very intensive study of the Scripture. Particularly when, for me, it's when I'm, I, I have that built in because that's when I prepare to preach and teach um, Bible study or whatnot. Uh, for somebody who doesn't have that as a built-in part of their schedule, that they're going to have to be studying the Word to, to teach or preach, then you need to build that in. I believe that each of us needs to have a time when we just read through Scripture, that we experience it as the story, and think about it, pray about it at the same time. But you also need to have a time when you're not reading it casually or uh, just reading through, but where you really focus on what it says and you meditate on what it says. And to meditate on something means to... To think about it, to pray about it, to consider it, to think about how it fits with other things, to think about what, what impact it would have on your life, uh, to think about how that is reflected in terms of the popular beliefs and the culture, all of those kinds of things. Everything you can you, that will come into your mind about how that fits. Now, uh, Luther, again, Martin Luther, referring to Psalm 119, he uses that and says, Luther instructs um, his readers that we should not only read the Bible and think about it, which is what most people think meditate means, but Luther says we need to externalize it. We need to read it out loud. We need to, you know, we need to hear ourselves saying it. We need to um, read and reread, pay attention to, reflect on it, write it. One of the people who um, he's in one of the other classes, he's not in here, so I'll say this. I don't think this would embarrass him because it's a very positive thing. Um, each Sunday, we will invite three people to assist by doing readings in our church service. Um, there's the, or, or participate, there's the responsive reading, somebody will lead that, there's the prayer of confession, and then there's the readings of, from the lectionary, Old and New Testament. Well, one of the people in our church who, whenever we ask, and he, he said to me several times, make sure you get this the, the stuff to me early, because I need to spend some time with it. And, of course, I sit behind him when he's reading. He... I send him a printed copy. I email him a printed copy of this. And he then goes and hand writes it out. Because that's his process for understanding it. By writing it out in his own handwriting, he is slowly going through it and having a greater understanding of what it says and what it means so that he can read it more effectively. And that's brilliant. And that's a wonderful thing that we can and should do. Is if you're looking at a passage of scripture, one of the things you can do to really help it sink in is to write it. Studies have shown that there are different ways in which we learn things, different ways in which we take in and then retain things. The, the, pro, the part of the brain in the process when we write something is not the same as when we just read it or even when we hear it. Each of those uses a different part of the brain. In fact, I heard, who was it recently that uh, someone was unable to read but they could still write? Um, because different, the 
who has a brain injury. Um, there are different parts of the brain that are used for those things. Uh, it's kind of a mystery how we learn these things. Uh, a fellow who was the president of Denver Seminary, a client of mine, um, was really exhausted one Sunday afternoon. He'd been a pastor, and he laid down to take a nap, and when he woke up, he'd been a missionary in South America for 20 years or something. When he woke up, he could no longer speak English. He could only speak Spanish. And he ended up dying of brain cancer. It was a, you know, a tumor. But the tumor, one of the effects on him was that he couldn't remember how to speak English. Even though he was American. He was he, he, you know, born and raised in the U.S. and just had been a missionary, so he was fluent in Spanish. The brain works in weird ways, is my point. And that when you write something, you are using a different part of the brain, and you therefore are helping it sink in and stick with you. It's a really wonderful discipline. Now, if you want to write all of the Psalms, that's great, but you don't have to do, or I'm not saying write the whole Bible out. If you were just dealing with a passage and you're meditating on it, and you say it out loud so that you hear it, write it down so that you, in all of these ways, it's sinking in and and in the process of doing that, think about what it means. Think about how it applies to your life. Think about how it should apply to, to all of the Christian's life. How we need to apply this in the church, and on and on and on. This is what meditation means. To really chew on it. In fact, you know the, the word uh, ruminate. You know, I, you know, to say I ruminate on scripture, that literally means to chew on. That's what cows do with their cud. And yet, so when we talk about ruminating from a mental point of view, it means literally to chew on this, to get every, all the nutrients out of it we possibly can. And you can do that in some of the ways I mentioned. Okay? Any questions or comments about that? Um, the next is approach the Bible in faith and obedience. I almost should have started with this. When I was talking about the, uh, the various approaches to interpreting Scripture, diachronic, synchronic, etc., the other day, I mentioned that some of them they, once you start talking about these larger categories, they immediately break down into those who approach in faith and those who approach cynically. There actually are disciplines of biblical interpretation that intentionally approach Scripture with a, a negative critical attitude. You know, you can have a positive critical attitude, and that is, I really want to understand what this means, um, and analyze it and interpret it. But there are some who assume a negative approach. You are not going to be successful in growing spiritually. And interpreting scripture if that's the approach you take. You know, those are, that's the very liberal, sort of non-believing kind of uh, anti-supernatural kind of folks who approach scripture that way. Um, the scripture, you all, most of you know how important philosophy is to me. The Bible is not a book of philosophy. It is not one to be argued in the same way philosophy is. It is God's own word. Now we study it, we think about it, we analyze it, we, in that regard, we're critical, you know, critical analysis, not to, critical doesn't mean negative in that regard. Um, but we recognize it as God's word, and we approach it in faith and obedience. And the expectation is, God, teach me through this how I can have more faith in you, how I can be more obedient to you. That's the attitude we go into it with. Um, the book of James, the first chapter, says, Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. This is the obedience part. We believe it in faith. We do it in obedience. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Do we remember what scripture has taught us when we walk away from the book? But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gets freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. You want to be blessed by God? Study His Word and then in faith and then obey it. Jesus said, if you love me, you will what? My obey my commandments. You'll do what I tell you to do. And that's the approach. We need to have that assumption when we go into it. Now, obedience is only possible by the Holy Spirit. By our own efforts, we are not up to being obedient to all Scripture. So, in that, we have to approach in faith that God will bless us in that in order to be obedient. People who just say, I'm going to buckle down and grip my teeth and tighten my belt and I'm going to be obedient to God's word. 
That's not how it works. We have to have faith that God will uh, give us the ability. Um, First John says, everyone born of God overcomes the world. And you go, yay! But it continues. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. We have to have faith in order for our obedience to have any grit, to have any success. Um, so, we approach the Bible in faith and obedience, not by our own power, but in faith that God desires for us to learn it. The next is, take note of the biblical genre you're reading. We get into a little bit of what we said before there in terms of genre. But for you, people, um, people make the, the mistake of, I, I said earlier that somebody picks up the Bible and they start reading a passage and go, whoa. I started in Revelation, and this is just weird. You know, somebody who begins their Bible study in Revelation, or I told them the story while you were out of you and I when we first got married, starting to study Isaiah together, and going, woo, 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 you know. There are places that somebody who is not, doesn't know Scripture, is not used to it, and doesn't recognize the fact there are different kinds of writings, they are going to be very quickly overwhelmed and discouraged and walk away from it. There are parts of Scripture that give, um, that are, are easy to access. The Gospel of John. There's a reason why the Gospel of John is more often than any other published by itself as a handout. Because the Gospel of John does not require an enormous amount of historical understanding. It's pretty straightforward narrative. It explains the theological points. The other book that's, you know, that's commonly done is the Gospel of Mark. While it doesn't have the theological depth of John, which is why John is popular. It's, it's both approachable and it's theologically quite in depth. But the Gospel of Mark is the shortest. It's the most direct. It actually has the most energy. You know, Mark is known for the fact that he go, throughout it he says, and then immediately and right away, and you know, there's this, there's this sort of energy in Mark that, that I think draws people along. But we have to have a recognition that what we're reading the genre that we're reading, the kind of writing, will make a huge difference in how we how we approach it, how we understand it, whether or not we understand it. Um, we cannot read Lamentations with the same expectation that we you know that we approach the Gospels. It's going to be a very different experience, right? So we have to pay attention to that, and and this is less an objective technical kind of thing than it is you, me. We have to do this ourselves. Um, be aware of the historical or cultural background issues. Again, we've talked about that some. There are a lot of places in the Bible where if you don't, and this, this goes back to what I was just saying, if you don't have some knowledge of what's going on, you are going to be lost. If you don't know what the Passover is all about, then you, when you read about Jesus being the Passover lamb, you're going to go, what in the world lamb? What has that got to do with anything? If you don't understand... Israel's 40 years in the wilderness, you won't have a, com a complete understanding of Jesus' 40 years in, of temptation in the wilderness. You know, there are these parallels. Which is why this takes some work. We have to be aware of historical and cultural background, and if you don't have that, then you either need to learn it, or you need to have resources available to you, uh, tools, that will help you with that. I... I always recommend, in fact, I required this for the students who took our class in How to Study the Bible, that they purchase an NIV study Bible. And the reason I, I, NIV, I mean, I think that's a, uh, one of the very best translations that's out today. But in addition to that, it has the most com complete concordance, over 25,000 words in the concordance, in that one book, in the Bible. It has a dictionary, it has extensive footnotes. I have taught Bible studies before using nothing more than the footnotes for the historical background and things like that, that I find in the NIV study Bible. Now, there are other good study Bibles, and so I'm not saying that's the only one, but to me, that's one of the very best ones. And that means that when you're reading along and you come to something and you go, what is that? Then you can go, okay, verse 27, and it, it will explain any of those sorts of questions that you might have, and it's right there in front of you. Now, we have to be careful because there's always a danger that we get so enamored of the historical background, the cultural, the political, the archaeological support for this stuff, that the actual Word of God becomes secondary to 
And we can't let that happen. Now, I love the historical stuff, as you know. Um, I, I love the archaeological support for this stuff. I really value that, and I think there's a place for it. But I don't let that be the point, so that the Bible just becomes kind of a, a lead-in to all the rest of this trivia stuff. Um, it's very valuable to know the history of the ancient Near East, for instance. To know about the Assyrians and the Babylonians and when they came and where they came and what effect they had on the Israelites and because a lot of the stuff in the, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, makes a whole lot more sense if you understand that. And when they, they were there and how that fits into the history. That's all very valuable. But if, if you're so fascinated by that, that becomes the only thing you're paying attention to and you're not actually reading God's Word as God's Word, then you have missed it. So we do need to have historical and cultural background, but we need to not be overwhelmed by that. And another thing we need to not be overwhelmed by is that um, there are some people who are out there writing, and you'll, especially online, since anybody can put something online, you know, the idea, well, I read it on the internet, it must be true. Um, I get a lot of emails from people asking me questions. I get a lot of emails from people sending me stuff. And one of the things I got fairly recently, and this has to do with, it, with Islam, because I teach on sort of comparative religion sort of stuff as a Christian minister. And I teach on Islam. <clears throat> well, somebody sent me an email and they, they attached, or actually they copied and pasted this long article from this guy. I don't know who he is. And he was going on and on about how Islam was a moon cult, that they worshipped the moon. And that's why they had the, you know, the moon and star as their symbols, and that, you know, uh, that the moon was one of the ancient gods that they incorporated. And I'm reading all this stuff and I'm going, this is just hoopy. This is wrong. And so I wrote back to this person, I said, you really need to be, and because this person wrote to me and said, oh, I just read this and it's great, and, you know, this is all, and clearly, she had accepted that this was all true. And I, went, I wrote back and I gave her sort of point by point why this is not true. And I said, in terms of the moon cult, every ancient culture had a moon cult. You cannot, you cannot say that Islam is unique in that in, in having, you know, that the point that was being made in the article was there was a really active moon cult that existed in, that, in the Arabian Peninsula when Islam started. So clearly, they must have just adopted that. And I said, you know, every culture in the ancient Near East had a moon cult. And the reason is because the two great lights in the, in the sky are the sun and the moon. One of the big differences between them is you can't look at the sun. But you can look at the moon. And so it became more of an object of worship than the sun did, actually. And so, I, but here I am, this, this dear woman had accepted this whole article by this guy who did not know what he was talking about. Well, people do the same thing with Christianity. This one happened to be about Islam. They do the same thing with Christianity. They draw these conclusions that simply are not supported in fact. You go online or sometimes even printed books, and you read this stuff, and you have to think critically about that. Now, wait a minute. And a, one good sign is if there's only one place that you find that, then you really need to have questions about it. Okay? Uh, because there's a whole lot of wrong stuff out there. And it will take you in the wrong direction, particularly if you're preaching or teaching. You make that a focal point of a sermon or a, or a lesson, and you could be leading people way off the wrong, in the wrong direction. All right? Is that fair? So you need to know something about this stuff, but make sure that the things you're paying attention to in order to learn it uh, are, are, you know, are right, <laughs> that they're true. <clears throat> you need to pay attention to the context. This sort of goes back to letting Scripture interpret Scripture. Most of the cults and false pseudo-Christian religions have taken some piece out of Scripture and interpreted that by itself. Every word is part of a sentence in the Bible. Every sentence is part of a paragraph, which is part of a larger discourse unit. And there's different words for that. Discourse is a good one. I think that's the one our book uses, right? Uh, it's one, one book that I read recently. Uh, but pericope is the word we used a lot when I was in, in, in seminary. Pericope means a, a discourse, a, a section. Um, which can cross over between chapters and all that. But, and then you have the whole chapter, and then you have the, you know, the whole Bible. You've got to read any passage of Scripture in light of the whole Bible, or you will be led astray. It's like the devil is sitting there just waiting for you to focus on one thing to the exclusion of other things, the balancing part of the rest of Scripture, the context that will give you the right approach. He is... He is sitting there waiting to try to take you in the wrong direction by letting you take something out of context. Um, and especially if you were preparing lessons, 
you have to understand that. I'll give you a, 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 an example of the context being important. Um, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul is talking to the Corinthian church in Corinth, and you need to know something about the church in Corinth and what they went through, Corinth being a place where they had very active temples to various pagan cults, um, including the, the temple of Aphrodite, and so temple prostitution was very common. There were pro prostitutes who were priestesses of the temple of Aphrodite walking up down the streets every day and every night, uh, inviting people to participate in worship with them, which is what they called it. Um, and you need to understand the culture. Well, Paul, in 1 Corinthians 11, he says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And, and you go, well, what does he mean by that? Well, if you read the whole context of Corinthians, and if you learn a little bit about what was going on with him, what Paul is saying is, you have to be prepared to give some stuff up. That's his point. You have to give up the lascivious lifestyle you have. You have to give up the expectation that, you know, wealth is your birthright, or whatever else it is. It doesn't mean you have to be poor. But Paul, if you read the context, he talks about the fact that he is, he, he's preaching without pay. That he is committing himself to this ministry with no personal benefit. He doesn't get paid for it. He's having to support himself by making tents. And he has not asked for anything, so they can't accuse him of, of greed or, you know, doing this for money or anything else. And so the whole point in that passage is Paul is saying, if you are serious about your commitment to Christ, you may have to give up some things. In fact, you will have to give up some things. You can't have the same values and priorities that everybody else has. Well, you're not going to understand that unless you take the larger context of the whole chapter and in fact all of the Corinthians. Um, but if you do, then you've got a much richer, more complete understanding of what he's talking about. That Christ comes first, and if that means we have to give things up, things we enjoy, things we may even think we have a right to, but if we are called on to do that for the sake of Christ, then we have to be ready to do that. That's where Paul is going with that. There's just one example of it. Um, and there are many, many others, obviously, that you have to read the chapter and the book. In fact, read as far as you have to in order to feel like, okay, I now understand the context for what they're talking about. Read the Bible in community. Again, many of the errors that have been made is because people read the Bible in solitude and they thought they'd figured it out for themselves. I've told some stories about people who've come to me when I was teaching in Seattle and said, oh, I finally figured out how Jesus is both the Son of God and also man. You know, he was a man and then he got adopted into uh, being the Son of God when he was baptized. You know, and he thought, I figured it all out. You know, I, all by myself, in my my room at home, I figured all this out. And I say, well, that's one of the very oldest heresies, it's adoptionism, and I've told you before, this fellow who has been attending my class got really mad at me, because I didn't say, oh yeah, you figured it out, whoa, you know. Um, but people do that when they, because none of us has complete knowledge. None of us has completely the ability to understand or interpret. And God acts through others in the body. Um, scripture says that that as we believe in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit gives gifts to every person. Every believer in Jesus receives one or more gifts for the common good. In other words, he gives that gift to you and you and you and me and everybody else so that we can build up and lift up the body. Well, interpretation of Scripture is one of those things that we need to look for. If that's not you know, one of your strongest gifts, then how great it is that there are other people around who may have that gift. You know, the gift of, uh, of uh, preaching or of teaching or etc. And so we really need to focus on trying to study God's Word in community. Now that means small groups, that means one-on-one, -on -one, it means a men's group, whatever. Because we can draw out meaning. The Holy Spirit will speak through other people. Some of you have been to our Bible studies. We haven't done it in the last ten weeks because we've been substituted the lecture for now. We're going to reinstitute that soon. Um, but for those of you who have been, and Carolyn, you can't say this, but you, in the Bible study, when we have a, a screen and we've got a, a passage of scripture up there, the next passage, and I put it up there, and do you, any of you remember what the first things that I say when I put it up there almost always? Remember what I say? My friends in Seattle used to tease me about this. Carolyn? What strikes you about that? What strikes you about this? What jumps out at you? It's always the same thing. 
What strikes you about this? What jumps out at you? Now, why do I ask that question? Instead of just saying, okay, now let me tell you what this says. Because I believe that the Holy Spirit can give understanding to different people. Now, from time to time, somebody will say something that's a little off track. And I go, well, you know, I understand where you get that, but... And I might direct them somewhere. But quite often, somebody will have an insight about this that I had not thought of or had not seen. That is very valid. And so, I believe the Holy Spirit speaks through the whole group. You know, and we get quite a few people in our Bible studies. And that's an example, I believe, of the fact that God can... God, the Holy Spirit, can speak through others. And when we read the Bible or study the Bible in community, we will have a much deeper and broader and less likely be off track understanding of what Scripture says. Yes? Yeah. <clears throat> I, I think uh, the Jewish people, at, at least historically, studied, studied the Bible a lot, the, the Old Testament. Yes. And one of the techniques they used was having the students sit, two students, going over a piece of scripture and... And arguing about it. Debating it. Mm -hmm. Arguing about it. There's a, there's a word for that. I can't remember what it is. But it's very similar to yeah. what you're talking about, isn't it? Yeah. Exactly. There's a great scene. Do you remember the Barbara Streisand movie, Gentle? There's a great scene where there are a bunch of these young men and her, because they thought she was a boy, that was the whole point. They're on their way back to school, you know, back to the yeshiva where they're all studying, and boys sitting in the back of this wagon, and they've got the droga open, and they're read, they've read a passage, and they're arguing about when, because the Jewish day is based upon sunrise and sunset kinds of things. I mean, some, when, when the sun rises and when the sun sets are critically important to some of their interpretations, and so they're having an argument about when, technically, when does the sun set? Well, is it when you can no longer see a shadow? Is it when, you know, they go on and on and on about this? Well, that seems like, you know, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. But that's a reflection of the discipline the Jews have always had to really, as a group, either as two people or as a group of people, to struggle with Scripture, to, to you know, work with it and interpret it, etc., etc. This is why we have, you know, the Talmud, the commentaries on the, the oral law, which were the commentaries on the written uh, law, which run the 1,600 pages or something. You know, it's huge. Um, so... Yeah, the, the idea of together working on what does this mean? What does it say? And again, I'm not saying that you argue about a long time about when the sun sets or how many angels can dance on the head of a pin, which really was a question in the scholastic time, uh, early scholasticism. Um, not things that don't matter, but what, what is this saying to us? And to do that as community, okay? Then to begin the journey of becoming a faithful interpreter. Part of what that means is that we all come to the Bible as learners. We all come to the Bible, or should come to the Bible, with humility, no matter how long we've been doing this. Um, I, I spent a number of years in school uh, studying this stuff. I have spent a lot of years preparing it. I still am just, uh, and, and people more than me, you know, far more learned than I am, will look at Scripture and just be in awe of it. Still, still see things, still find things. Scripture says that the Word of God is living. And one of the things I think that means is that there will be various times when you come to God's Word and a passage you've maybe read many times before, and all of a sudden it will mean something completely new to you based upon where you are now, based upon what your need is now. To me, that's the living part. That it can apply dynamically, not statically, but dynamically to wherever we are. But in order to get to the place where you really are a mature and experienced interpreter of Scripture, Sure, being the key word there, um, you have to start. You have to start someplace, and usually start small. Um, I shared with Carolyn recently. I had someone say to me, "Well, I'm, you know, I'm reading this book, Christian book, and I don't understand a lot of the words." And I felt as though I was being asked, you know, for a magical key. And and all I could say is, "Well, the only thing you can do is learn them." Okay. That at a certain point, you start small, but if you're going to grow, then you start small, and in this case, when I talk about studying Scripture, you take a, a passage of Scripture or a, a short book, you know, uh, take First John or, or, you know, Philemon or one of the short books, small ones, and say, I'm going to spend a month or six months 
really focusing on this and doing the exercises that your book talks about, diagramming it, studying the words, studying the historical context, spending time reading it and reading it and ruminating on it, chewing on it, you know, asking God to give you all of the meaning out of it, until you really feel like, here is a passage of scripture that I've spent weeks and months on, and I feel like God has given me, you know, the, I've sucked the marrow from the bones of this passage in the most possible, positive way possible, and, and that's a good thing, and then go on from there, but you have to start somewhere. And the book, and I, I'm not unrealistic, I know that some of you, you take this book and you get to this part about diagramming and you go, really? <laughs> you really think I'm going to do that? But you know what? If you take the fact that this is God's own word written for you, seriously, and that all the meaning that is worth knowing, in one way or another, is found in here, then this isn't too much to ask. And the point is, I don't do this anymore. Okay, I am confessing to you. But I've been doing this for over 30 years, in one way or another. I'm you know, teaching, only preaching for the last uh, five and a half or so. Um, I've been in a lot of classes where I, I, I've done all of this. And I've done it in Greek, for instance. Now, they have a process they call marking, which is a kind of diagramming that we studied in Greek in, in Greek hermeneutics. And so I've done all of that. And it's not to say that there are times when I will go back and do that again if I feel like I really need to take it apart. But I do the process without necessarily having to write all the, all the words and arts and stuff, but I still do it. And so you need to as well. The natural tendency is to go, oh, I, I, I don't need to do that. Well, how, how many years have you been doing this that you feel like you can bypass that? Because it's a very, that's, a, whether you are literally doing it or you simply are doing it, you know, because of experience that you had in this, one way or the other, that's the process. That's the way to really get into it. Um, and so, if you're going to be a faithful interpreter, if you're going to grow in your ability to interpret God's Word, as a preacher, as a teacher, then you need to do the work. You need to have the discipline. You need to start small, if you have not done this extensively before, and really do all of this stuff, and follow the kind of disciplines. Because, you know, it, it, this, some of you are also in our hermeneutics and communi communication hermeneutics class. And I think some people were really surprised that while the diagramming this, the recommendations are not the same in the communications class, the, or book rather, the hermeneutics book, the homiletics book, as it is in Grasping God's Word book. It's basically the same thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So here's two different writers without reference to one another, and they have, they both are basically recommending the same thing. This is the standard way to really get into what God's Word is saying as an interpreter, whether it's being for the sake of hermeneutics or for the sake of pre you know, directly for the sake of preaching. Um, so you need to do the work. Start small, focus on it, learn the disciplines, and after you've been doing it for a few years, then you don't have to go through the, you know, the, the mechanics of it, because you will automatically be thinking that way, and you'll be, when you, you know, read a text of scripture, you'll be able to think about the relationship of the words, even if you haven't drawn your little arcs and boxes and stuff, okay? If you take an inductive Bible study course like um, Precept Ministries, K. Arthur, uh, her books, How to Study the Bible, which is one of the texts we used in our class on how to study the Bible. Um, they have, they recommend colored pens and different colors representing different kinds of focus. And, and still the diagram, you know, the boxes and the drawing and the arrows and the whole thing. This is not just this book, and it is the acceptable way to learn to really dig the truth out of God's Word. Lynn? I think that is true, and maybe we've been doing it as individuals unconsciously, but for major problem solving, et cetera, you know, uh, somebody tells you something and you're not so sure about that. And so you walk around, I do my gardening or housework, mundane things, and I'm muttering away and, and what the heck, and, you know, thinking about that and then I'll walk in my library and pick up something and look at it. And then, when my brain seems to be not quite so overwhelmed by the what the heck of the thing, I can sit down with a piece of paper and my pen and I always end up with a real scrambled looking mess, which makes sense to me, maybe not to others, okay. and the arrows and, and sometimes colored pens do come out. Yep. And then at the end of the page, you know, maybe at the end of the fifth or sixth page, there is a presentation or a 
um, answer to something somebody's put to you that, you know. Right. Yeah. It, well, it's, it's, it's our individual way of uh, processing. Well, and the books, you know, this book and the one in, in the homiletics class, um, they didn't invent this idea, and you're right, this is a basic, you know, this is a version of a brainstorming technique that is used uh, with conceptual things in business, and creative industry, etc. But this is a little more structured because you're starting with a text rather than sort of with just random thoughts. Okay, let's take a break. I want to spend a few minutes now going through some reflection questions based upon the things we've just talked about. And some of these you're not going to probably want to speak out loud. But I want you to think about these things. And they have to do with where you are now, for the most part. The first reflection question is, what role do prayer and meditation play in your study of the Bible? Are you now praying when you start to study? Are you praying after you study? Are you spending time in meditation, as we talked about? Or are you just, just reading? Or are you not doing any of those? You would be in the majority, as Christians, if you really did not spend time studying God's Word. So you need to ask yourself this question. Ask yourself this question now, and then ask yourself this question in a month from now, and six months from now. And if the answer isn't an increase on the amount of prayer and attention that you're doing around your reading of the Bible, and study of the Bible, again, I think that there needs to be two. I've always counseled two aspects. One is simply to read it, because there is... To read through the text gives you a flow, and there's an aspect of that. Sometimes people, the only thing they do is drill down into specifics. And again, sometimes I can get people in trouble. Some of the some of the cults I believe started because they drilled down too deep on one passage and did not have a sense of the overall flow uh, of the message of Scripture. So, what role does prayer and meditation play in your study of the Bible, and will you work on increasing that? Second, what steps can you take? to make prayer and meditation a regular part of your Bible reading. What, what mechanism might you be able to put in place that would cause that? I'll give you an example. In terms of meditation, I mentioned writing. You know, and in that case, I was talking about writing out the, the scripture so that you're you know, sort of experiencing it one more way. But another very important thing to do is to keep a journal. Now, a journal is not a diary. Dear journal, today I woke up thinking about, no, in fact, C.S. Lewis stopped journaling when he became a Christian, because he said, he realized that it, his whole focus was on him, you know, this is all about me, and it, it, it's an act of selfishness, it's, a, it's like, it's, it's a confession that I think I'm the most important thing, and so I'm writing my thoughts and feelings, etc. Now, he wrote a lot of other things. But that's not the same as keeping a Bible journal where you actually are, because it's a mechanism to help you think, well, what passage have I just read? What does it mean? What are the key words in this? You can ask yourself questions, or it may simply be one question. What do I think God is saying to me through this? And how might I apply it to my life? So there are mechanisms that you, you can have. Um, it may be that you simply develop a habit that when you pick up the book, before you open it, you spend a few minutes in prayer. That God would prepare you for this, that He would speak to you, that He would teach you through it. And that you just develop that as a very simple little, you know, picking up the book is the, the thing that keys in me the need to pray before I open it. And then you do the reading and study, and then perhaps your meditation from that comes in the process of in writing or some other process, you know, whatever process works for you, that you incorporate more prayer and more meditation as part of your Bible reading. Think about how that will work for you. And some of that is, fit, is a physical thing. We Protestants sometimes really miss the fact that what we do with our physical bodies, you know, our physical mechanism, makes a huge difference on how we react to things spiritually. It's like, you know, we don't kneel anymore. We don't genuflect anymore. We don't do any of the things that historically the church has done because we think that's all, you know, just a necessary show. Da, da, da. Well, what you do with your body makes a difference in what happens to your spirit. And one of the things that you can do in a very practical sense is have, have the same place that you study 
that you read the Bible, that you pray, that you meditate on it every day and do it at the same time, or it's not going to become a habit and you're going to, you're going to stop doing it again. You know, Carolyn and I both have the same place, basically the same time every morning that, that we focus on that. And that's not, again, it's to suggest that we've got this all figured out, but we've developed that as a habit. And so there's not a question, where's my Bible, you know, uh, where am I going to go this morning? Sometimes the, the, having predetermined those physical things can make a huge difference. Third question. Do you approach all of the Bible as pointing to Jesus? Which parts seem the most difficult to view in this way and why? Does anybody have a... Would anybody speak to that? Would anybody say anything about that? Are there any parts of the Bible that you have difficulty understanding how they point to Jesus? And do you approach all of the Bible as referring to Jesus? Any comments? I think I struggle mostly with with Genesis. Okay. Uh, uh, in many ways, I struggle with Genesis. Uh, uh, you know what the heck comes up a lot, uh, and so it's pointing towards Jesus. Um, yeah, I, I struggle with that. Okay. In, in the whole book of Genesis, I, I struggle. All right. I'm going to be preaching on Genesis, especially Genesis one this this Sunday. Um, why we believe in Genesis. Well, let me give you, I'll use this as an example. Genesis 1 starts out, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and the Spirit was hovering over the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Um, and then he goes on, and God said, and it was, and God said, and it was. Well, when you say something, what comes out of your mouth? Words. We then read the first chapter of John, the Gospel of John, and he says, In the beginning was the Word, Logos. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Through Him all things were made, and without Him nothing was made that has been made. And then it goes down, after referring to John the Baptist, it goes down a little further, verse 14, and says, um, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. The Word that God the Father spoke was the second person of the Trinity, Jesus. In fact, chapter 1 of Genesis, you know, in the beginning God is a reference to God the Father. He speaks the word, and through him, Jesus, all things were made that have been made. Without him, nothing, you know, nothing's been made. Um, and then it says, and the Spirit was hovering over the waters. So all through, all, the whole Trinity is there in the first chapter of Genesis. That's an example of how, if we study it, if we think about it, if we read it, the whole thing. You know, if you don't read the first chapter of John and read the Word, through Him all things were made, without Him nothing is made that has been made, and then think about the fact that God spoke the Word, that it's, it's called creation through fiat, that by speaking it, speaking the Word, it came into being. Without, without that whole context, you're not going to get that. Make sense? And that's an example of how even Genesis 1 points to the reality of Jesus. And John 1 tells us everything was made through him. Okay, Marvin? Was it the discourse of one of the other two, but the book was talking about the tent pegs, and that they were half of the ground, and that meant that Jesus was buried and he rose again, and they were finding stuff everywhere, and you know, you can take things a little too far oh, yeah. sometimes. Oh, yeah. yeah, and that's why it, the... Um, we talked a little bit about one of the processes of interpretation that was very popular in, um, through much of church history was allegory. And what they would do is take the most obvious examples, uh, I mean the most obvious Old Testament references to something in the Old Testament, and turn it into a meaning about Jesus. For instance, the passage about, um, it's actually apocryphal, but the passage about Abraham circumcising 318, I think it is, of his family members of his tribe, and then they would take 318 and using the the letter references for 318, it ended up looking like the initials of Jesus plus a cross, and that was a symbol of Jesus, and you're going, oh, come on, how, you know, how far do you have to stretch this thing? We don't have to make that work. We believe all of Scripture as a whole refers to Jesus. That doesn't mean we make every little jot and tittle somehow symbolic of the coming of Jesus. Okay. Fair? Yeah. 
What does it mean to let Scripture interpret Scripture? I think I've answered that pretty plainly, but what do you all think? Can you think of any other examples of that or any other references? Any comments on it? Boy, I've really beat you guys up today. <laughs> there they sat stunned for some moments. Well, to let all of Scripture, the easier, the clearer parts, help us understand the less clear or more difficult parts. Is it possible to believe and understand the Bible without obeying it? Let's start with that. Is it? If you believe the Bible, it's God's Word, and you understand it, will you in invariably obey it? But there would be no point. Oh. I mean, if you... If you believe it, understand it, then why not obey it? Is that what right. you mean? Well, Mark Twain said, it's not the parts of the Bible I don't understand that give me problems, it's the parts I do understand. <laughs> but, in effect, you know, you could add, but don't want to do. Uh, Marvin, first, and then Bob. Maybe a silly example, but if you, if you knew this lottery ticket was the winning ticket, but you didn't buy it. Wouldn't do you any good. Yeah. Bob? We'll take, for example, on a certain <clears throat> things like the ceremonial law. You can believe that, you can understand it, but you don't have to carry out all the aspects of the ceremonial law. Mm -hmm. There's where the whole context of Scripture comes in. Right. Um, the, the New Testament plainly says that. That's not for us anymore. Um, I think that there are people who maybe believe that the Bible is the Word of God and they understand it, but they are fearful in a way that they are reluctant to obey it. And I think Mark Twain, the Mark Twain quote, which is lighthearted, at the core of that, when he says that you know it's not the parts I don't I don't understand the Bible, it's the parts I do understand. <laughs> If you take that seriously, then why would those trouble you unless you were fearful of them, of what they would mean? Um, well, or giving up what you perceive as your control of your life. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, let's face it, so much of what we do is motivated by fear anyway. That's that's human. And, and, and we're not always rational about that. You know, we deny the obvious sometimes out of fear, out of, you know, out of self-justification, out of all sorts of reasons. But, um, but I think, it, I think it is possible to believe and understand the Bible, but not obey it. Because we're afraid of it, because we are hoping it's not true. You know, that we're, we're actually fooling ourselves. Now, I don't think that's any of you, hopefully. But I think there are people like that. Marvin? Maybe if you're an earthly father or earthly um, people that move over you who are not so nice, you have an inherent fear that Almighty God may not be so nice either. And, and if you give yourself to Him, you're not sure what He's going to do with you. Yeah. <laughs> and if we have this concept that He's supposed to make us happy and look after us all the time, and, and it doesn't happen, and we see all around us people suffering, we go, oh, I've got to think about that. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to have the right concept of, of His position and ours so right. that we don't be afraid. Yeah. Okay, when you read the Bible, do you either consciously or unconsciously take into account the genre of the book you're reading? Or let me ask a different question. Uh, ask this in a different way and get the same point. Have you ever picked up the Bible and started reading it and then been completely confused or thrown off or, you know, like in Revelation or in something else, because you didn't really understand what the genre was, what the context was, or anything else? Have you ever had that experience? Mm -hmm. Can you think of an example of what that was? I think an example for a lot of people is the first chapter of Genesis. And that's what I'm going to be preaching on this Sunday, the fact that people read that and they expect to evaluate it like as though it were a, you know, a, a science text. That's not what it is. That's not The genre is not a science textbook. And so when we try to read it as a science textbook, which is a genre, any kind of textbook, um, we get frustrated, confused, and disappointed. 
and yet there are things that it is intended to do. And so come and hear my sermon on Sunday, you'll find out. <laughs> Carol? I think that there are times when I've read poetry or hyperbole and not realized, and I had, had to have it explained to me later that, right. that oh, that's not meant to be literal. That yeah. was just how they expressed themselves. It was more like idiom than literal. Right. And that's another thing, it's not genre, but it's just, um, we're going to talk about it in the next class in terms of figures of speech. When Jesus says, be perfect even as your Father in Heaven is perfect, does He really mean I have to be perfect? Or is that hyperbole? Is that making a point by stating the point in the extreme in order to let you know that this is serious, but not really expecting that you're going to be perfect? When we say, reach for the stars, <laughs> What does that mean? Obviously, there are figures of speech. Well, there are figures of speech in Scripture, too. So it's not just genre. It can be idioms, and idiom is, a, is, is an expression that doesn't mean literally what it says, but has come to be accepted as having another meaning. Well, he climbed up the ladder of success. Really? You know? Um, all, all kinds, you know, we have dozens of those. It's probable that any five-minute conversation any two people have in English, I think it's probably true in other languages too, although I'm not as fluent in them, um, we'll have half a dozen idioms and don't even notice it. And we have to, but when we read them in Scripture and we think everything is going to be absolutely literal there, that's not true either. There are differences in genre of the different books, and there are different idioms and expressions, and we have to read it, and that's why authorial intent, the intent of the author, is important. Because that will give us an indication of, you know, what, what aspects of the language he's using are we to take literally verses that are figurative in their expression, right? Alright, number seven. With whom are you reading and discussing the Bible? And how have you benefited from studying the Bible with others? If you're not studying the Bible community, do you know an existing small group Bible study that you can join? Where's that leading? Um, are you all involved in, in Bible studies? Do you want to be? <laughs> um, we have our community groups in our church that are not necessarily Bible studies. That's one of the options when the group decides what they want to do. Our community group right now is reading uh, screw tape letters. But we will be reinstituting, and it, it won't go away next time we have a series. Um, in, in the summer, I'm going to do an eight-week series on world history as part of our Friday lectures. But we're going to find another time when we can have our Bible study. And it's it's not quite a small group Bible study because we'll get 50 people in there. Uh, but but we but it's very interactive. It's not just me standing up there telling people. It's, it's people giving their ideas and opinions. And so it becomes much more like a small group Bible study. It's very valuable to do that. It's very important to do that both to keep us on the right track and also so that God is using other people in, in the insights that he provides them to help us grow as well. Yes? So when someone says, well, I don't need to go to church or I don't need to whatever, whatever, or I read the Bible at home or I whatever, what is their, their fear or their rationale or their whatever for being able to do this without? Yeah, well, I think most people who say that are just lazy. <laughs> in my experience. They just don't want to get out. I mean, they don't want to have the obligation of that. And yet, the, the answer is, Scripture says, forsake not the gathering of yourselves together. It tells us to meet together to worship. Now, in terms of Bible study and stuff, um, the point is simply, no matter who, how how mature we think we are in our ability to understand and interpret the Bible, there still will be truths that, that we hear and learn from other people and their perceptions. Sometimes we will grow almost as much by people's perhaps, you know, misunderstood perceptions. Sometimes I hear people say things in, in church or Bible study, whatever, that I know aren't quite true, but the fact that people think that makes me realize that the issues of uh, how people get confused about things and, and helps clarify things for me and also as, a, as the pastor helps me decide how I'm going to move forward. Um, so, yeah, but in terms of why people do that, I think mostly it's just lazy. Yeah. Do you think it's really laziness or fear of commitment? Well, you know, you... many people are afraid to commit, but like ours community group, um, 
First time you attend, Norm with his booming, emphatic voice says, if you don't plan on coming every time, let us know and don't come again. Whoa. <laughs> like, he wants... I don't think that was part of our instructions. <laughs> <laughs> he, he wants... You know, it's an overstatement of the fact that he wants right. commitment. Right. And, and we understand that. You know, we all laugh just as we just did. And, um, because, as you said, others are counting on yeah. We share, we um, burden ourselves, we uh, pray together, we study together, and not always the Bible, but things that take us back to the right. Bible. And, and I think that the idea of asking people to make a commitment, the community group actually calls for more of a commitment. When we're talking about church attendance or Bible study or whatever, it's entirely voluntary. And see, it used to be that if you lived in a community, uh, you were expected to be part of the church. You were expected to be part of that parish church. And if you weren't, then something's wrong with you and you find yourself pretty much alone. Okay? Um, and there really was a sense that there was an obligation there. Nowadays, things are so free and easy and loosey-goosey that... People drop in, they drop out, they go away for a while, they come back. Um, you know, we don't count heads, we don't, you know, we don't uh, tattoo numbers on them, we don't do anything. Um, th th we don't punch their cards. Uh, so people who say, well, I don't, I really don't think I'm going to make that commitment, my response would be, what commitment? Just come, enjoy the fellowship. You know, have a cup of coffee and a cookie at the end. Listen to the sermon, agree with it, disagree with it, whatever. You know, hear God's word read. That's all freebies, and there's no, uh, and I, I think, Lynn, your observation, people may think that there's a commitment involved, mm -hmm. but they're not really thinking, if that's what they say, in terms of church, whatever Norm says, um, in terms of church, <laughs> we don't, we don't, um, no, nobody's going to come looking for them if they haven't been there for a while, and in fact, we are very particular, for instance, we don't ask people who are new to stand up, ever. That's a dumb thing to do. You don't ask them to introduce themselves or tell us their favorite color or anything else for the very reason that in our culture, people want to remain anonymous, especially early on. And so we give them that freedom because I would rather somebody remain anonymous and feel comfortable, you know, they weren't embarrassed, they weren't made to stand up or whatever, and then they come back the second week, the third week, the fourth week, whatever, they, they feel okay with that, and then eventually, they feel like, yeah, this is my community. I'll be part of this. But we're not going to try to throw them in the deep end of the pool the first time they walk through the door. And so, but some people, I, I believe, some people may still think, well, I don't want to make that commitment without even thinking about the fact that there's virtually no commitment involved, at least early on. Okay. Um, eight, can you think of an instance where additional historical or cultural background information aided you in understanding a biblical text? Joan, you're nodding. Do you have an example? Oh. I'm picking on you. Yes, you are. <laughs> Let me see if I can think of one. Uh, um, well, I know when I was reading the, the Josh McDowell book, um, and he goes into you know the background, and I think he's going into the background background to sort of uh, give evidence that the biblical writers really were writing from that background, and not 500 years later or whatever, right. because of the way they understood um, uh, all of those uh, those cultural. And historical details, but to me, it helps me connect with those people. It helps me feel like they were more real people, and then it gives me a better chance of looking at what Jesus was saying or or whatever was happening through their eyes. And I guess one of the uh, details that I, I hope I remember correctly is when Jesus is, is talking about um, there will be two women grinding grain and one will be taken and the other left. And then Josh McDowell goes into detail about how there were these small millstones which were meant to be turned by two women, right? right? So when Jesus said that, people would get into their heads an actual picture of what he was talking about. It was very, very relevant. And then, you know, knowing that detail myself makes it more relevant and more real to me. Good. Excellent. Good example. Doug, when I listened to the your videos on the uh, survey of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. That helped me with what now when there's a New Testament reading and it says from Mark or from 1 Corinthians, okay, I can place the author and some of the of what was going on mm -hmm. 
you can put that text in the context. Good. Excellent. That. So that, that was significant help. Good. Anything else? Any other examples? Chris? Well, not that I have an exact example, but with the, a lot of the parables, and I'll, I mean, I've, I've been studying a lot of the background and the yeah. historical stuff. And this opens up meaning, that some of it are just small things, but it just kind of can put you in the setting, therefore you actually understand what is being said and what it means, and and you can kind of relate to it now more than just, oh, well, here's a story. It's right. not like you can understand what they were actually feeling or saying, or what they would, you know, if they thought this was really outrageous, or if they didn't, you know, it, it, all that stuff, to me, it puts it in a, a much, much deeper and context that allows a lot more, you know, deeper understanding of what's going on. Good. Excellent. Um, Marvin? Jesus at the well of the Samaritan woman. If you don't know the backgrounds, it doesn't really mean much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't know the relationship between the Samaritans and Jews, or who the Samaritans were, or why she says we worship, you know, our fathers told us to worship on this mountain, but you worship at the Temple of Jerusalem. You know, what's that all about? You have a much richer, it doesn't mean you have to know all of the details in order to get the, the basic story, but it is much, it's like the difference in two dimensions and three dimensions if you have an understanding of that stuff. It's also true, and I suggested earlier, don't read, don't believe everything you read, that um, some of the supposed historical background which people have come up with and published and that people read and they quote all the time, simply is not true, or at least it's not supported. I'll give you an example. Um, the whole thing about it's easier for an animal, a, a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And I have actually heard people teach that, well, what the ref Jesus is referring to there is that the openings in some of the minarets at the corners of cities in the olden times were called were small and were called the eye of the needle. And for a camel to get through there, they had to get down, they had to unload them, get them down on their knees, and take them through to get them inside the city. And that's not true. Or at least that's not, I, I've never seen, and I've read other scholars who said they've never seen any reference to that at all. When Jesus is talking about it's easier for a, cam a camel to go through the eye of the needle than a rich man to get into heaven, I believe he is referring to what Charles Williams called one long bloody string of camel. <laughs> that literally, you could get a camel through the eye of a needle, a real needle, you know, they used bigger needles back then because they were so, you know, canvas and stuff. Um, he's not, the idea of us needing to come up with some idea that it meant something other than that is not necessary and it's not true. I, I know of no indication that that whole, you know, small opening into a city that a camel could crawl through is the real thing. Hyperbole. Hyperbole. <laughs> yeah. Well, and again, Charles Williams was his point about one long bloody string of camel is that you quite literally could do that, although it'd be a lot of work and not very pleasant. Um, and so it is a hyperbole. It's Jesus' way of saying, boy, this is hard. It's not impossible for a rich men to get into heaven. It's like it's not impossible to figure out a way to run a camel through the eye of a needle a little bit at a time. But um, so be careful is my point. Have you ever changed your view on what a text of the Bible means by studying the context more carefully? And there's an expression, a text without a context is a pretext. A pretext means an excuse. Preachers who come up with uh, you know, a message they want to preach and then they force that onto Scripture, that's using a pretext. Um, can you think of an example or, uh, or illustration of this maxim? Have you ever had a case where you heard a sermon preached or a lesson taught and you thought, boy, he's pushing that too? Far. I don't see where he's getting at. It doesn't seem correct in context, etc. Have you ever had that experience? Marvin? A lot of the rapture preaching, and then they would use that. Mm -hmm. One will be the other will be left when I preach it. Now you turn that the other way around, because in the context of Scripture, the bad ones were taken. <laughs> exactly. The ones left behind were the ones that were good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, there, there are some, several examples of that. I, I recently read a... a a little story by Howard Hendricks that he had had surgery and he was at home uh, and it was a Sunday morning and there was a knock on the door and two young men, he doesn't identify who they were but it's pretty clear, it was an older man and a younger man wearing ties, I would guess in short sleeves, carrying, you know, <laughs> uh, carrying satchels and they said we're, we're just visiting house in the neighborhood to talk about God and religion, we're wondering if you'd have a few minutes and he goes sure come on in, <laughs> Howard Hendricks who's one of the great theologians of the, of the age and he started talking to them, and one of the things that Jehovah's Witnesses believes is that, that they retranslate the scripture 
John 1 again, instead of saying, uh, in the beginning of, was the Word, and the Word was, was God, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. They changed that to read, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Meaning it's not solitary, not singular. And they said this to Howard Hendricks, and he said, well, where did you get that? I haven't heard it that way. And they go, well, that's in the Greek. Well, the story, as Hendricks told it, is he reached over on his shelf, and he pulled out his, you know, Nestle Allen in Greek, and he opens it to Johannes, to, to John, and he said, well, read it to me in the Greek and tell me what it means. And they couldn't. Um, and he said, well, I can. In fact, I teach Greek. And it says, he was with God and he was God. And they very quickly, you know, need a retreat. Well, I had a very similar ex uh, experience with a group called The Way International, which is a cult. They were on our college campus. And it, it was basically the same thing. One of them said, well, Scripture never says that Jesus really was, you know, the only God. He's only one of them. And I said, and where do you get that? And they said, well, if you could read Greek, then it would tell you. And, um, and I said, well, actually, I do read some Greek. And I said, do you read Greek? And he went, ah, da, da, da. <laughs> um, and so you get that kind of thing where, without, you know, where a lot of the sex, cults, etc., they will have a pretext, something they want to prove. The extreme examples of that are when they come up with their own translations of the whole Bible, like Joseph Smith's translation of the Bible, or I won't say New Century because they had that wrong before. The New World Translation, which is the Jehovah's Witnesses translation, they have retranslated it to say what they want it to say. That's the ultimate pretext. So the context is what will give us um, the clear messages of that, assuming that we're not dealing with somebody's perversion of the original text. And for each of you, what next step can you take on the journey to becoming a more faithful interpreter? Of all the things we've talked about today, I think each of you, each of us, need to think about, how can I go deeper? How can I do more? How can I be more this kind of an interpreter of the Bible? For my own sake, my own personal growth, but also so that uh, if God is calling me, or if God does call me to teach classes, to preach sermons, whatever else it might be, are you going to be more equipped than you were before? The goal is always to be better in terms of our our understanding of, our following God's scripture, God's word. Marvin? When you read a passage of scripture, like the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, and peace, um, generous, kindness, goodness. Try to ev ev evidence that in your life on a daily basis. You know, right. Bear that fruit rather than just read it and understand what it is, but it's meant to be lived. Yeah. Yeah. By the power that is given to us, not by our own power. Right. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Thank you all very much. That's it for this week.